Hey there folks, and welcome to another episode of Crit Hit Review. Today we're going to be taking a look at Studio MDHR's run-and-gun platformer, Cuphead. Boasting not only a distinctive graphic style which pays homage to the early era of animations, but also bearing a reputation as being a sadistically challenging game, Cuphead's a passion project developed over the course of seven long years. But is Cuphead a sweet treat, or a bitter brew? Find out on this episode of Crit Hit Review. Yeah, okay, so it, it might be a bit difficult. A fair bit. And honestly, that's fine. Like, brutally difficult games are my cup of tea, especially when none of the challenge comes from fighting with the controls. Cuphead only requires the player to learn six buttons and your direction keys, which works wonderfully on a gamepad and is functional on a keyboard, especially since key binding is an option. The only awkwardness I had control-wise was learning to parry, since it required that I hit jump after I was already in the air and flying face first at any projectile or object that was pink, since pink means parryable. Counterintuitive at first, sure, but still, it grew on me over the course of my playthrough. Which helps that given the parry mechanic is at the heart of this game, since not only is it used to dissipate or dodge over things, every successful parry also gives you a charge of your super meter and allows you to get through the fight that much faster. But yeah, you're here about the game itself, so let's get down to the brass tacks! Cuphead is a run-and-gun shooter, with a fair bit of emphasis on platforming elements, but most of all on its exquisitely crafted boss fights. During the course of the game, you're going to come across three different types of stages, those being run-and-gun, boss fights, and the parry mausoleums. First off, there's the six run-and-gun levels, challenging combinations of survival, platforming, and the occasional bits of puzzle solving, especially if you're going to be aiming for the vaunted pacifist rank. These can be a bit lengthy, especially given that you can only take three hits before dying, and there's no checkpoints in the middle, or anywhere to be seen, so you need to clear it all in one go. That said, their main rewards come in the form of the gold coins scattered throughout. These coins can be traded in at a, uh, surprisingly intimidating vendor to buy not only alternate weapons, but also charms. In the case of the weapons, these are less upgrades and more side grades which favor certain situations and playstyles. Though you're only able to carry two around your kit at any given point to challenge stages with, so do expect to be switching around which one you think is most appropriate for the given challenge. Accessory-wise, you can only wear one of the charms, but all of them grant unique passives such as extra health, the ability to auto-parry the first object you jump into, and turning your parry into an attack, which enables you to bounce off non-pink enemies. Personally, I was all about the smoke grenade that turned my dash into a dodge with invincibility frames. Anyways, the second and most common type of stage in Cuphead is the boss fights. And honestly, this is where the game really shines. Instead of forcing players to muck through prolonged levels to get to the game's main antagonists, it thrusts players straight into the encounters, each one made to feel unique for the challenges they offer. Players are forced to dodge, parry, and learn the boss's patterns so that they can survive the boss's various attacks in each of their phases. And yeah, in regards to the phases, that's a comment I can't emphasize enough since all of the bosses in Cuphead are multi-phase rumbles which not only allowed Cuphead to flex its artistic muscles on the transitions, but also allows the developers to throw some absurdly varied attack phases at you, so even if you manage to master one, you still might get taken completely off guard by the abilities that it displays during its next phase. And they all possess enough health that you'll generally get a good taste of what it has to offer during each round. Not that you'll really be able to track a boss's health short of dying, where a handy-dandy racetrack course shows how close or far from victory you were. Well, you know, beyond tracking the transitions themselves, since they at least provide an indication that you're advancing through the fight. Also, for those in the audience who have heard the term bullet hell thrown around when this game's been described, and who have been perhaps hesitant about trying Cuphead due to it, well, I've generally found the term fairly inaccurate. 
The closest you'll generally get is during the few boss fights where you're turned into a plane and given controls more suited to a shoot 'em up. And even in these rare instances, the projectile spam never really reaches critical mass for bullet hell esque projectile saturation, save for a few rare instances in the entirety of the game. Also, there are optional difficulties available, as players can toggle simple mode for boss fights that are too challenging, effectively putting the game on decaf and allowing players to navigate the island with far less challenge. The downside to indulging in the impulse, however, is that boss fights will have phases outright removed, disheartening for those who appreciate the graphics in the game, will receive reduced ranks for stage clears, and lastly won't be able to access the final area of the game. Which is to say, you'll be deprived of the last two boss fights the game has to offer, the bit of story contained there, and the ability to actually finish the game unless you step up and finish all the bosses on normal. Oh, and when I mentioned, like, your ranking is going to be reduced in simple mode, that's important because there's a number of secrets related to your clear ranks on the boss fights and on the stages, and... Yeah, you won't be able to obtain those on the boss levels if you're in simple mode. On the flip side of things, there is an expert mode, which adds health, projectile, speed, and more varied attack types to the bosses, making the game's difficulty curve especially steep. The final stage type that players encounter is the Perry Mausoleum, a trio of crypts the player can plunge into where Cuphead is tasked with protecting a chalice from a pack of pink ghosts by parrying them into oblivion. Essentially, it's a neat minigame which is not only fun, but it serves the purpose of teaching players to parry more accurately and to chain parries together, as they come face to face with a growing number of ghosts while possessing different movement types and speeds. That, and it also rewards players with an ultimate display of cup magic, no lie, that uses 5 charges of the super meter in exchange for an effect that's extremely damaging or useful, such as limited invincibility. Honestly, the only downside I've found to these stages is that I couldn't redo them once clearing them, since I had a blast with them. I suppose you could also sort of count the Corte of World Maps as almost a free-roaming stage, if you squinted a little, as well each one serves as a hub for the running gun levels, the mausoleums, and the boss stages. They're actually also rife with small secrets, like NPCs you can talk to and do little side quests for, there's secret coins hidden in certain locations to help supplement your spending sprees at the shop, alongside the fact that some of those NPCs will also cough up some cash, and there's even shortcuts cleverly squirreled away that entirely make sense with the layout of the map that allows you to access later stages before they'd unlock by clearing out earlier stages. There is alternate means of progression available, which I found really neat and clever. Oh, and yeah, those scores I mentioned earlier for the boss fights and the running gun levels, it's actually with the NPCs on the open level stages where they come in handy, since you'll be talking to NPCs on those maps who allow you to unlock certain features. Okay, story time. So let's, uh, let's see here if I can do this justice. <clears throat> So Cuphead and his brother Mugman venture to hell, somehow managing to get a winning streak in a casino run by the devil, and when challenged to a bet for his casino versus their immortal soul and their winnings go, this sounds like an amazing idea, let's go. Or, well, rather, Cuphead does. Mugman's all like, plez, no, cut, cut, cut your losses. Which, incidentally, Q crushing loss, followed by them pleading for mercy and him giving them a dread ultimatum. Acquire the souls of everyone else who has shirked what they owed the devil, or pay the price. And thus begins an extremely violent cross-island assault spree. It's pretty on the nose for old school cartoons, really, especially with the amount that have old scratch playing in them. What's more, you can even hear an awesome rendition of the game's plot and song if you just hang it on the intro screen long enough. So yeah, story-wise, you have most of it laid out before you right at the start of the game, and you get what you see, with the developers having instead chosen on designing their characters and stages just chock full of references to the time period itself. You only need to take a look at the speakeasies where you fight the twin boxers, or the Zeppelin boss. There's also a good and a bad ending, but the decision's hardly pivotal given it boils down to whether or not you select an option on a dialogue box and cop out on the last fight, 
or put your dukes up and actually get down to the nitty gritty. Mm, this is one of those cases where I'm not sure I can actually say enough good things about Cuphead's graphics. It looks like a beautiful love letter to the old school style of animations you'd see right as they moved from black and white to color. Though, there totally is a black and white option and even a two-tone option for those who unlock them. But even beyond that, the characters and many elements of the world itself have a sort of vibrant bounciness reminiscent of the Steamboat Willie cartoons, Betty Boop, or even Felix the Cat. Though, you'll also see other elements of old school animation pop up, like real world-esque backgrounds juxtaposed with Cuphead's animation style. All of it has a certain appeal to it, and in a style you just don't tend to see in gaming, especially since it not only embraced the high points of the era, but other nuances, such as film grain, and even the ability to cause the color to bleed like old school film, which do not tinker with the bleed too much because you will literally kill your eyes. Oh, and uh, all the character designs are just genius in a sort of what kind of acid were they dipping into type way, so pretty much very fitting for that animation style. Especially given that not only are all the bosses animated with loving care, but the developers managed to give them all distinct visuals for their attacks, integrating visuals and gameplays flawlessly, and providing a really nice, distinct personality for each one of them. Plus, the transitions from phase to phase are just really spectacular to behold, even as you replay the level again and again because you just got murdered again. So, remember everything I love about the graphics? It's basically the same deal here. The music is just so fitting to old school cartoons, up to and including the sort of sound scratch crackle you'd hear in old episodes of things, which you can make more prominent with an unlockable vintage mode. It's just spot on. And there's just a number of moments in the game where it breaks out into song like older cartoons. The Barbershop Quartet song, for instance, was great, hilarious, and also played with the sort of morals that would be espoused in some of those earlier oh, there's tunes. To do, there's leaves to rake from the old banjo. Alright, so there's a lot on my mind when it comes to this game, especially in the way it was constructed. I found the way it paid homage not only to retro cartoons, but also gaming, charming and altogether clever. Though, I appreciated avoid hindering things with limited amount of lives and let me get back into the thick of things quickly. The running gun stages were brutal, but the decision to have them independent of the boss fights was appreciated, as it meant I could basically hop into that style of gameplay if I wanted to, and likewise with the boss fights which were some of the more challenging and enjoyable combinations of reflexes, problem solving, and weirdness that I've gotten the privilege to indulge in in a while. Sure, it could be frustrating to die to one over and over again, screw you to hell ghost train, but the way each one was lovingly animated and given personality, even the act of hitting a phase transition felt like an immense reward and I got this sense of palpable relief and pride at every little bit of progress I made. Also, I just really liked the King Dice setup at the end of the game that was sort of... I recognized it as an homage of sorts to the final boss rushes that were present in Mega Man games, which are a staple of running guns, albeit the solving of the problem of throwing rehashes of earlier bosses in my face. It's grueling, yes, there's a whole lot of new things to learn, I completely agree, but it makes that final push to the end of the game all the more satisfying. And I suppose that's my takeaway from the game. The story is silly, but it's enjoyable in a cartoonish sense, which is very fitting. The graphics and the audio are unique and lovingly crafted. Sure, some people who play the game may end up frustrated by its difficulty, or disappointed that the final area of the game isn't accessible if you buckle under the pressure and rely on the game's simple mode. But I appreciate it wholly for what it does. Yes, it's ball-bustingly hard, but that's Cuphead and I wouldn't ask it to change at all.